Okay, so I'm going to start and I'm going to multitask. So if I look like I'm not looking at you, it's because I'm also letting people in at the same time. I'm Robin. I am Day Day's business partner at FODMAP Every Day. And we're so happy to have you here. And I'm going to ask if I'm going to do a little bit of sort of the housekeeping and let people know what's going to happen here today. So this will be about an hour. Um, and we are going to um, be following up afterwards in a day or two with all of the links to everything that we've been referring to today on the call. And you will also have a link to this session. It is being recorded. So please don't say something that you want repeated in court. Um, <laughs> and we also are going to be sending you a link to be able to do a free download of our baking ebook which is like a 250 page book on low FODMAP and gluten. 275, making. don't cheat us. <laughs> 275, <laughs> exactly. Um, so yeah, a lot of the, a lot of the um, information that you will be getting today is also in that book. So we really want you just mostly just to be able to feel like you can relax and listen. If you have questions, please ask them in the chat and then Dede is going to stop talking every few minutes and take a look and you know yeah. read the chat and see if there's any questions she can answer for you and then at the end we'll make sure that we've covered as many as we can as well um, so again if you can just make sure that your mic is muted we love seeing your faces so feel free to keep your video on and um, hold on I'm going to start live on Facebook Excellent. Hello, everybody at Facebook, too. So we're going to start. Make sense, Robin? Yep. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. I am Day Day Wilson, co-founder of FODMAP Every Day with Robin, and this is our low FODMAP and gluten-free holiday baking uh, video that we're recording so that you'll be able to refer back to it. And just so you know, I'm going to be mostly, I'm going to be dealing with sweets. We're not getting into much yeast or bread conversation. I'll just say that up front. We're talking about cookies and brownies and cakes and things that are good for gift giving for the holidays. And, uh, you know, when you need a showstopper um, uh, centerpiece dessert for your holiday table, that sort of a thing. So whoops, let's see. Now my forward button's not working. Let's try again. There we go. So I'm just going to dive right in. But Feel free to, as Robin said, write questions in the chat. I will be checking the chat uh, periodically and also pausing at different times where I think it, you know, there might be questions um, to, to, to be answered. So the biggest thing is with baking, it is very different than cooking, is you need to make a plan. And that's a very broad thing, but it's the kind of thing where, let's say you're making a... Uh, a beef stew and you haven't really planned. I mean, you've bought the beef and, you know, you have some onions or not in the house and, you know, you think in your head, you're going to add some rosemary to the dish. And then it turns out at the last moment that you don't have any rosemary and it's, you know what, substituting in some time is going to work just fine. But when it comes to baking, um, substitutions are a whole different ball game. Um, baking is very precise. It's sort of a balance of an art and a science. And so planning is key. So you'll see on this list, um, I put host gifts down, you know, if we're going to be uh, visiting people or mailing gifts uh, to people this holiday season, you want to think about that. Because uh, for instance, you're not going to make a dessert that requires refrigeration, if that's the case. So you have to think about those kinds of things. Is it something that you're going to serve at home? Well, in that case, if it's something that has billows of whipped cream on the top, that will work, but that's not going to work so well if you're going to a potluck. So you want to think about logistics for sure. Uh, storage, uh, length and how. I mean, you really need to uh, take stock of how much room do you have in your freezer right now uh, in your fridge? Do you have an extra fridge? Uh, is it going to be dry storage? Um, so that you're not caught unawares at the end. You know, if you get to the end of the recipe and it says this needs to be stored in an airtight container, uh, flat layers of brownies and single layers separated by parchment, at that point in time, you don't wanna be caught 
without a container that you're able to, to follow the <clears throat> instructions for. Um, and then obviously, you know, think about other requirements. Are you hosting a party where you know you or someone else cannot have nuts? Interest, you know, that's important to pay attention to. Do you also need to be dairy free? That kind of a thing. And our website, I hope you're all very familiar with FODMAP every day. One of the things that we have is a recipe filter. You can go to the recipe filter and you can, for instance, check off dairy free and search for dairy free recipes. Um, as it stands, uh, as the reason why I called this gluten-free is because even though the diet, the low FODMAP diet is not a gluten-free diet, um, it, uh, 99% of our recipes are gluten-free. So if you are, um, if you are gluten-free and you've joined <coughs> us because of that, there's plenty for you to learn. And then I've mentioned stacking here. I'm actually going to mention stacking a few times. Um, I just want to see everyone, let me put on the view here. Raise your hand if you know what stacking is. Do you even know what I'm referring to? We have some hands going up and we have some no's. Okay, so really briefly, Robin will, in the follow-up information, will include a link to an article that we have uh, called a stacking during the holidays. Now what stacking is, since we're talking about the low FODMAP diet, is let's say you have something like raisins that contain fructans. Fructans are a particular type of FODMAP. We know that we can have about two tablespoons of raisins in a sitting. What we can't do or shouldn't do um, is create a recipe where a serving size of whatever it is, let's say it's a muffin, has two tablespoons of raisins in it and other ingredients that contain fructans. That's stacking the minimum and allowable amount of fructans in the same thing, in the same thing that you're eating. And so what that does is it pushes you into a moderate or high uh, FODMAP situation. So during the holidays, we know that this is really difficult because it's very rare that we're just eating one thing, right? At a party, whether it's hors d'oeuvres, dessert, or, or whatever. So stacking is something you're gonna to need to brush up on and we're need, we need to do the best we can. And I think, you know, I we're sort of the anti-deprivation FODMAP website. I feel like serving size is the way to go. Um, you know, if you have half of a muffin and half of something else at the same time, instead of a whole, um, you might be able to keep the, um, whoops, we might be able to keep the stacking under control. So check the basics, take an inventory. What do you already have? Maybe you already bought some butter while it was on sale and it's in the freezer. Um, make sure your spices are fresh. Okay, if the last time you bought cinnamon was a year ago or more, and I've been guilty of that, um, it's time to get uh, some new spices uh, because they really do lose their potency. And if we're, you know, th the baking season, there's three or four months where maybe we're baking more than usual and it will make all the difference in your recipe if you have fresh, fresh spices, even though they're dried. Check your leaveners. So what I mean by that is recipes that call for baking soda and baking powder. Again, if they're old, they could have lost um, their, their ability to help your baked goods rise. So check those um, expiration dates. Um, I'm going out of order. I'll bounce back to the top. Oven thermometer. Okay, big thing in baking. I, I've been recipe developing for 30 years. I've written 17 books. The great majority of those books have been on baking. And I can tell you that the number one thing that happens when people write me when something's gone wrong is that they have not followed the recipe. And we'll get to that in a little bit. And the other thing is tools. You have to have the right tools. They make all the difference in the world. And an oven thermometer is important because believe it or not, if you set your oven to 350 degrees, we're assuming the recipe called for 350 degrees, you set it for 350, there's actually a fairly good chance that that oven is only registering 325 
or 375. Having a 25 degree variation is actually not unusual. So buying an oven thermometer, and these could be less than 10 bucks, um, and having that in the oven to check is really important. And then don't panic. If your oven um, is high or low, um, you can actually calibrate it. You will most likely be able to look up that information uh, with your, um, you know, you can Google your oven um, uh, model and you'll be able to learn how to do that yourself. And the necessary equipment, let's just talk about equipment for a moment. I just mentioned equipment's important. If my recipe or anyone's recipe calls for an eight inch pan and you say to yourself, yes, ah, I have nine inch pans close here, that. I'm just gonna use those. Close the lid. That really is not okay. Um, oh, we're hearing somebody, if everyone could please check their uh, audio and turn it off, that would be great. Um, it's really not gonna be the same. Um, you're gonna have a much uh, flatter cake. It's going to bake at mm -hmm. a different uh, time frame. Um, it could possibly even mess up your yield because it's just gonna, the sizes are just going to be very different. So please try to use what is called for in the recipe. Otherwise, you know, we can't guarantee the results for you. Now I brought some, um, I brought some props. So this is a tiny six inch pan, and I know a lot of people don't uh, use six inch, but I'm, I just brought a tiny one to show you. Do you see how these sides are really straight? And this is a brownie pan, same thing. Sides are really straight. So if you go to the supermarket, um, and of course we're based in the US, so I'm mostly addressing people, uh, you know, what's typical for us in the US. If you go to the supermarket, you can buy cake pans, but they're usually very flimsy. They're not good quality. And very often they flare out. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, you're probably used to looking at my pictures or other pictures of beautiful cakes on the internet, or you're used to looking at beautiful pictures of cakes in magazines and books, and they're tall and straight and gorgeous. I can guarantee you that they were not made in those lesser expensive cheap pans that flare out. This is more of a, um, a professional grade pan, does not mean that it's expensive. Um, and we have links for these sorts of things um, that Robin will be passing on to you. Um, other things that we might call for with tarts, if you don't know what a loose bottom pan is, a loose bottom tart pan is literally a pan that has a bottom that comes out. So when a recipe calls for a loose bottom tart pan, that's what this is. If you don't use it, you're not going to get your tart out of your pan. And unless you live around the corner for me, I can't help you. <laughs> um, spring form pans literally have a spring on the side that opens up and that allows you to get your cheesecake out or whatever it is. Oh, there's people creeping around my house making noise. Okay. Then loaf pans, same thing, check this out, okay? See, one's straight, one's flared, one's much bigger than the other. This is a typical nine by five loaf pan. A lot of recipes call for this. A lot of recipes call for an eight by four as well. Not only do these look really different, but the volumes are actually much more different than you would think. And again, this is the kind of thing that, you know, people like me, professional bakers think about when you see slices, a lot of times when you see slices of quick breads and they're beautiful and they're square and they look so great, it's because they were made in a pan like this, not like this. So I'm very specific in my recipes. I will always tell you what you need. Um, so the information is there for you and I, I recommend that you follow it. And then measuring cups and spoons and a scale. I actually could talk about this for an hour. I won't today, but suffice it to say that not all measuring cups and spoons are created equal. So for those of you who are familiar with our site, you will know that we present um, all of our recipes in volume. And then we also provide metric. And that is so our recipes can be um, used by people around the globe because we are a global brand. However, I'm based in the US. I have access to US ingredients. Uh, and in the US, we do bake by volume. So 
when you are following recipes on my site, on our site, the volume measurements are more accurate. Now that might sound crazy because you might say, well, wait a minute, if I have a scale, five ounces is five ounces, five ounces is as precise as it gets. But if you're measuring by volume, that's not precise. So how could Dady have just said that? The reason I'm saying that is because the most precise way to replicate a recipe is to make it the way it was developed, okay? If the recipe was developed measuring by volume and then the weight was extrapolated from that, the weight is actually the secondary method. So for my recipes, follow the volume, use high quality measuring cups and spoons, and you will have the best results possible. That said, scale certainly comes into play with baking uh, for chocolate, uh, for nuts. Um, I'm trying to think of the other things that I often will call for by uh, weight. Cheese, you know, there's savory baking, savory scones, things like that. It'll say five ounces of uh, cheddar cheese shredded because measuring shredded cheese is cheese that's already shredded is going to be very difficult to be accurate, right? Like maybe it's light and fluffy. Maybe the person's packing it down. Who knows? But five ounces of chocolate or cheese is five ounces of chocolate or cheese. And then you're going uh, uh, over to cut it. Oh, and I should also mention, um, okay, one cup pecan halves chopped is not the same thing as one cup chopped pecans. So for the, for the person who said they're a beginning baker, this is the kind of thing you have to pay attention to. Hopefully the recipe writer knows what they're writing. Now I can also tell you that there are recipe writers that don't necessarily know how to write a good recipe. But if I tell you to take a cup of pecan halves and then chop them, do not chop them and then measure them. You will actually end up getting a different measurement of nuts. So let's dive into ingredients in general. So we're, we're you know, all of us here are interested in the low FODMAP diet and hopefully you do know that it is not gluten-free and it is not dairy-free. Uh, obviously those things uh, come into play hugely when it comes to baking. So butter, butter and pure fats, Low FODMAP, no problem. So right off the bat, you don't have to buy anything labeled lactose-free butter, although it does exist. You can buy conventional butter. It is low enough in lactose to be considered lactose-free. So you're good to go in that regard. If a recipe calls for butter and you want to substitute a non-dairy fat, you can, but you're on your own. The recipes are presented as developed and they're going to work with the recipes that are suggested. Flowers. Okay, I've said before, gluten-free is not low FODMAP. Uh, we have an awesome article that you will get a link to that's all about how to choose a low FODMAP flour. Um, I will always tell you what brand I use, what specific, um, not just brand, what specific uh, flour I use and brand because they're different. So my basic go-to in our test kitchen is the Bob's Red Mill one-to-one. I find, I believe that it is the, uh, whoops, hold on, let me go back. I believe it is the flour that most closely duplicates a conventional all-purpose flour um, in our low FODMAP baking. Now it does contain xanthan gum. Xanthan gum and guar gum are not FODMAP issues. Now there are people who are sensitive to gums who have IBS and I understand that. If you need to use a gum free flour, of course, do so for your own health. But the recipes that were developed with flour blends that contain xanthan are not necessarily going to work. Um, sugars, sugar, brown sugar, rice syrup, no FODMAPs. Sugar is not a FODMAP issue. Maple syrup has a, a, a very generous uh, low FODMAP serving size. Now, golden syrup, molasses, and honey do not have a generous serving size. We're talking about a teaspoon. However, I include them because you will see in recipes such as our gingerbread cookies, which are classic 
rolled gingerbread cookie that you can make gingerbread people with um, have molasses in them taste like traditional gingerbread cookies but the molasses amount is low enough per serving right so if i tell you eat one cookie of a two inch cookie then that's the serving size but we're able to use molasses in the recipe so there's an article that um robin if you can make a note uh to include there's an article that we have called uh high fodmap foods with low fodmap ingredients molasses would be um an example of that so what i mean by that is people who are new to using the monash university app which i hope you all have you might look up something like molasses see a big red dot stop you know it means this is high fodmap and so in your brain you get oh this is a high fodmap ingredient that i can never have that i shouldn't have that's bad but the fact is that there is a low fodmap serving size of molasses it's only a teaspoon but we have used it to good effect in uh several gingerbread recipes actually on the site same thing with honey nuts know your nuts peanuts, almonds, um, there are pecans, walnuts, there are many, many nuts, Brazil nuts that are low FODMAP, macadamia nuts. Then there are nuts that do not have a low FODMAP serving size like pistachios. So again, nuts, nuts are not completely off limits, but use your app and uh, you can look them up individually. Chocolate, chocolate and cocoa, you will get um, lots of information on chocolate and cocoa. I have a lot to say about chocolate and cocoa. Certainly not all chocolate is created equal. And this is another beginner step. Um, hopefully when you're following a recipe, mine or anyone else's, when they ask for chocolate, let, let's say we're making brownies. We're making a recipe where we're melting down some sort of dark chocolate to incorporate into that cake or into that brownie. If that recipe does not tell you what chocolate the recipe developer used, you're already starting. Uh, you're starting, you know, with some possible issues ahead, and that is because we have um, chocolates with 45% cacao solids, 50% cacao solids, 65%, 70, 85, 90, you know, a very, very, very bittersweet chocolate is going to have, you know, an 80 to 95% cacao uh, mass content. A more uh, conventional semi-sweet chocolate is going to be about 55 to 60%. A lot of semi-sweet chocolates from the supermarket are going to have 45 to 50%. And none of these are substitutable for one another in a recipe where you're melting the chocolate and incorporating it into the batter. They will all react with the rest of the ratios of the rest of the ingredients very, very differently. So if I have developed a recipe using 55 to 65% dark chocolate. I will tell you that it is right there on the same line where it says six ounces, semi-sweet or bittersweet chocolate, preferably 55 to 65% chopped or finely chopped or whatever. If you only have 70% chocolate laying around the house and you use it, I can guarantee you that the recipe is not going to come out as intended. So not all chocolates created equal. You'll get an article about that, which also delves into how to read a chocolate label and know that you're choosing a quality chocolate. I'll just say really briefly that when it comes to fats, you want to see cocoa butter on that label and you do not want to see other fats. You do not want to see palm oil, cottonseed oil, any other kind of oil, other fat, other than cocoa butter. And the article will go into that in more detail. Um, cocoa, same thing. Um, natural cocoa and Dutch processed cocoa are two different things. Dutch processed cocoa means the cocoa has been um, treated for its uh, acidity. It's a it's a different product than natural cocoa. Uh, my recipes will are always tell you which one you need. Um, fruit huge topic right there's tons and tons and tons of low fodmap fruits that we can use um have a lovely tart that has a custard and grapes on top grapes are a no fodmap fruit oranges um bananas you can use ripe bananas we've got tons of banana 
uh, recipes on the site. It just comes down to serving size. Dried fruit um, can be high FODMAP, but there are low FODMAP serving sizes of raisins, of dried papaya, of cranberry, and of mixed candied peel. That's one of the things that's kind of buried in the app. I saw someone's face go, oh, and that's, I am so excited that you're excited. Wait, who, who is that over there? So I'm, I'm gonna be working on our fruitcake recipe today. And I've been all excited about using the uh, candied fruit. Um, liqueurs and wine, we have a whole article on alcohol. Um, there is a lot of alcohol that is allowed. Uh, we have several liqueur, homemade liqueur uh, recipes on the site that you can refer to. We have one for an orange liqueur that's kind of like our version of a low FODMAP Grand Marnier. We have a coffee liqueur that's like a Kahlua. We have a salted caramel liqueur that you can make from scratch. And we also have our version of an Irish liqueur. And then dairy, as I've said before, um, the diet is not dairy free, it is lactose free. And one of the uh, things with for us in the US is we do not have access to um, lactose free heavy cream. So here's a funny thing. So heavy cream is actually high enough in fat that an entire, you know, a half cup, half a cup of whipped cream. I mean, that's a lot. Like if you could picture like, half a cup on top of a slice of pie, it's gonna drown your pie slice. Um, half a cup of whipped heavy cream, conventional heavy cream is considered low FODMAP. But the reason why, if you're somewhere where you do have access to lactose-free heavy cream, the reason why I recommend using it is going back to that stacking issue, right? Especially at the holidays where we're gonna be eating a lot of different foods at a given meal. Any place that I can find to minimize FODMAPs, I'll recommend it because it'll just allow us a little more leeway. So before I go on to the next slide, I just wanna check, okay, fruitcake. Okay, someone says they like the namaste gluten-free. Uh, oh, okay, this is, okay. Someone said the Bob's has a nut allergy warning. It's probably because they, uh produce it in a facility um that has nuts so that's really good to point out other people are saying that they do use bobs excellent someone says they need to cut back on cholesterol so they do use margarine sticks and they had really good luck with one of our uh, banana chocolate chip muffins awesome you know listen here's the thing i always recommend experimentation I love baking because it's creative, but just know that when you make substitutions, recipe might not work the first time. Hey, could be better. I don't know. It's just probably not going to be the same. You can make notes for X next time. But the biggest thing with tweaking baking recipes when you're following the low FODMAP diet is that you are then also responsible for recalculating the FODMAP load. Right. So, for instance, if I've put walnuts in something and I know that the FODMAP in walnuts is in a correct balance with the rest of the ingredients in the dish, but you decide you want to substitute something else in for the walnuts, you have to be um, you have to be facile enough with the diet and understand stacking enough that you have to recalculate the FODMAPs for yourself. So shopping, those flowers, right? Look for flowers um, on sale. Some of the big box stores even have big uh, bags. Of, I see King Arthur in big bags all the time, sometimes the bobs. Um, during COVID, a lot of the stores near us uh, completely got rid of their bulk sections. Uh, they just recently reinstated them uh, this month. So if you have access to a place where you can get dried fruit or nuts or oats or things like that in bulk, it uh, often can be more economical. Um, I, I'm doing this, uh, I wanted to do this Zoom now because of the order ahead thing, right? So there are gonna be some recipes that maybe you're like, ooh, I wanna make that for a Christmas party. I'm going to, you know, or ho some holiday party mid-December, but it calls for black cocoa or it calls for candied fruit or it calls for instant espresso powder. And those are things you have to order ahead. Definitely do that now. 
Um, make sure you have everything you need in terms of parchment paper and your airtight containers and stuff like that that I mentioned before. I love the dollar store for tins this type of year. You can go in there, get all kinds of pretty little tins. Those are great for gift giving and even for uh, storing stuff yourself. And silica packets. So you know how when you order things, a lot of times it's vitamins or dried fruit, even some of my dog treats come with those little silica packets in them. And those are things, uh, they keep items dry. And you can actually buy them on Amazon. Uh, you can get like 30 of these packs for less than 10 bucks, or you can save them, you know, from when you do get vitamins and you take out that pack and little packet, you usually throw it away. You can put these silica packets in your baked goods, in your sealed tins, and it will, it'll help keep them dry. So follow the recipe. Um, I meant, mentioned this before, but I really mean it, right? So we're talking about follow the recipe in terms of ingredients. If I tell you, use this flour, don't use that flour. If I say, use 55% uh, chocolate, don't use 70%. And this includes the storage info. I find a lot of times people get to the end of the recipe, they pull that cake out of the oven, they put it aside to cool, and then they say to themselves, I'm done. There's nothing else for me to do, uh, but there is, right? So follow the recipe to the end. There might be some very specific cooling um, procedures. For instance, maybe you're making a fancy cake in a bunt pan. If you cool that cake until it's cold in that bunt pan, you're not going to be able to unmold it and get it out. So the instructions might say something like cool it for 10 minutes on a rack, unmold onto the rack, let it cool completely at that point. Once it's cooled, put it into a, uh, a room temperature uh, airtight cake dome or whatever the instructions are. So, you know, do follow the instructions. They are specific and they're there to help you have success. Uh, pay attention to serving sizes. This is a FODMAP thing, right? Uh, we have a lot of chit chat on our uh, every year. It usually comes up in the spring when I when I first put up our uh, blueberry pie. Our blueberry pie serves 24. Okay, I know that that's crazy making. We're talking about a nine inch pie. Most of us are used to cutting a nine inch pie into six, eight, maybe 10 wedges. But we're talking FODMAPs, folks. So, you know, I personally would rather have a slice of blueberry pie that's this big uh, rather than have none at all. But that's my personal uh, uh, approach. And that's why I made a blueberry pie uh, for all of you. But pay attention to the serving sizes or the FODMAP situation is going to get out of control, which leads into the stacking, 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 more stacking, right? We just don't want to get into that situation. So on the website you are going to find all kinds of desserts i mean desserts are my metier so um there, there's certainly plenty holiday and otherwise we have an awesome classic rolled sugar cookie recipe you can make it really it rolls out beautifully um the, the dough is very workable you can make it you know with a preschooler and just put pretty colored sugar on top, or we also have instructions if you want to get really fancy with royal icing and make them, you know, really, really decorative. But the cookie base itself is the same and it's very workable. We have the gingerbread recipe that I mentioned. We have a classic, you know, powdered sugar covered pecan butter ball. Sometimes they're called uh, Russian tea cakes or Mexican wedding cakes. That is that recipe. We have a chocolate crinkle cookie recipe. We actually have several toffee recipes. Um, whiskey balls, these are new for this year. So these are the classic no bake. They're usually a bourbon ball or, uh, but this is a whiskey ball because we're going with the, the fact that we know that whiskey has been lab tested and is low fat. So that starts with a cookie crumb and you're just, you need a food processor. You're going to grind up the cookie crumbs in the food processor. There is whiskey, there's some chocolate, there's some cocoa. You're rolling them into little balls. They look like little truffles, but they're no bake. You can put them in, you know, fancy little fluted paper cups. And the thing about those is they improve. They literally improve with age. So that's a really awesome recipe to look at. 
The fruitcake, which also improves with age, is not up yet. I'm going to be working on that this week. I hope to get to get it up on the site. Uh, okay, I'm going to say it out loud here. Uh, in less than two weeks, I hope to get it up on the site, and that way you'll have plenty of time to plan, make it, put it away in storage, get it nice and boozy, and you'll have that. We've got candied nut recipes. Those are awesome for gift, gift giving. We've got uh, all kinds of biscuits. We've got a regular biscuit recipe, which is fantastic. It's fantastic. We have a pumpkin biscuit. We have a cheddar scallion biscuit. If you make ham for any of your holiday tables and you make any of these biscuits, let me tell you, those ham leftovers are gonna rock the house um chocolate peppermint bark the peppermint bark that you see in expensive mail order catalogs with the layer of dark chocolate and the layer of white chocolate and the peppermint candy we got that recipe um and pies 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 and i'm telling you i mean of the thousands of low fodmap recipes that i've developed I stand by our pie crust. Our pie crust is one of my most beloved low FODMAP recipes that we have made. It's a little different than the one that's in my book. Um, I, I, I improved it since after we published the book. Not only is this pie crust workable and meaning you can roll it out and you can pick it up and you can move it over to the pie pan and all of that, um, but it doesn't need to be chilled. It does not need to be chilled like conventional pie crust. So it's actually even more streamlined than classic pie crust and um, it's buttery and delicious. Um, okay, let me just go look up in the chats. More information on butter substitutes for baking. This person says they've used uh, earth balance sticks. Um, flavor not great. Okay, so unfortunately, I think that the earth balance sticks for me have been the best in terms of texture um i i do not have a better recommendation so you know possibly what i would suggest that you do is go to a dairy-free baking website and you're going to have to try to you know do some uh juggling on your own where, where you're keeping track of the fodmap stuff but you're taking advantage of information from people who are focused on non-dairy uh baking um thank you anita yes nuts.com is an awesome uh uh place to go for dried fruit and nuts this the quality is always uh they're fresh high-end easy to mail order so those are some great great tips um okay so next slide okay holiday recipes easy all right let's talk about easy um for some people who are not real bakers but you want to make something um we do have recipes for you now i know that that first one sounds like a mouthful and sounds fancy and believe me the cinnamon pecan truffle ganache tart looks fancy, but all you're gonna do is you're gonna be taking purchased cookies and grinding them in your food processor and adding a little bit of melted butter. And then you do need, you do need a tart pan. And you're gonna pat the crust into the pan with your hands, no fancy uh, tools needed. You're gonna bake that for you know eight to 10 minutes until it's dry and crisp. And then the truffle filling is literally chocolate and cream that's melted together and oh excuse me excuse me there's some pecans ground up in the crust with the cookies the ganache is just chocolate and cream and there's like a little cinnamon and you're just melting that together and it, it almost looks like a hot fudge sauce and you're pouring that into the baked crust and then it's just chilled and that's it and it's i'm telling you it's even easier than the way I just described it. Um, and very, very fancy. And a little slice goes a long, long way. So that um, feeds a crowd. We have a Rocky Road fudge that uses like three ingredients. Um, that's very easy. Creme brulee, believe it or not, is really easy. You've got sugar and eggs and cream and maybe like a little vanilla and you're whisking that together and pouring it into little dishes and baking. And then you get to buy and or pull out a propane torch or a butane torch and get all fancy and uh torch you're going to caramelize the sugar on top um and that that goes a long way now salted caramel sauce made on top of the stove 
very easy to make, ridiculously delicious, great for gift giving. You can pour this over ice cream. You could drizzle it over pound cake. It can become, you know, incorporated into recipes. You could stir a little into your coffee. It's really delicious, made on top of the stove, very easy. We have a complicated truffle recipe where you're dipping it into a chocolate shell and it's going to be very fancy, but we have an easy chocolate uh, truffle recipe, which is just chocolate and cream and you let it set up so that you can scoop it out with a teaspoon and roll it into little balls and the balls are rolled in, in uh, cocoa and that's a very easy recipe. And we've got scones and muffins and a classic shortbread recipe and all of those are uh, pretty easy. And I'm always there to 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 help you if you have any questions. Um, let me go see the chat. Okay, someone wants to know: uh, Do you need to convert the cream and the recipes uh, if I mention lactose free? So, as I said before, um, you know we don't have lactose free heavy cream in the United States. Um, up to a half a cup of whipped heavy cream, so like a quarter cup of liquid heavy cream, conventional heavy cream is low FODMAP. So in theory, you do not have to convert. I often do convert or suggest it be lactose-free for the stacking uh, issues, not for like a pure FODMAP issue. Um, coconut milk instead of cream in the truffle recipe. Okay, really interesting question. I have not made it, but here's what I would do, Perry. I would, um, use don't use coconut milk use coconut cream okay so that's the first thing i would say is buy canned coconut cream which you should be able to find right next to your coconut milk and i would follow the recipe as is and all this is is the the coconut milk and the chocolate melted down and then it has to set so once it's set if it's not scoopable right if you cannot at that point roll it into balls if it's too loose and liquidy then you could actually add more chocolate to that mixture you don't have to throw that batch away remelt it again re chill it again and see if you get a rollable consistency and then make notes and the next time you'll know okay i need to add two ounces more chocolate to day day's recipe if i'm using coconut cream does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. If not, you can reach out to me later. Rhonda is one of our super users in the foodies group. Hi, Rhonda. She uses the Lactease Drops in heavy cream. This is a product that um, you'll get information about. It's literally, you know how you can take lactase enzymes uh, orally, which is another thing you can just do at every holiday party. Um, there are drops that can be added to dairy to make it lactose free. And we have an article on the site that Robin will send you later. It's called DIY lactose free dairy. And it gives you links to uh, purchase those lactase drops. So that's another thing you might wanna order ahead. So thank you for mentioning that Rhonda. Only so many things can stay in this head at a time and that was not front and center. Um, Okay, holiday recipes for a crowd, baking for a crowd. Last year, Robin and I, it was so challenging, you know, going into the holidays and creating our social media posts because, you know, everybody wanted to feel like we were still in a celebratory mood and could have a holiday, but in a lot of instances, the holiday was just with the people we lived with. Um, this year, people are, you know, venturing out a little more uh, now that more people are immunized and COVID is in a different um, uh, stage and level. And so if you do have a crowd, and that might be four people, might be six people, might be 10, 12, I don't know, we have plenty of recipes for you. There's a chocolate peppermint bundt cake that is an awesome like a uh, potluck cake, bake sale cake. Uh, you know, you're told to bring a dessert. It travels really well. That's a great cake. Now, these next two things. We have recipes for caramel pecan sticky buns and we have recipes for cinnamon rolls. They are awesome. They are also persnickety. If you are a beginning baker, 
I do not suggest you start with these recipes. These recipes come out beautifully if they are followed to a T, meaning the right equipment is used, all the ingredients, the measuring, the measuring is spot on. If you follow them, I promise you, when you see the photos, you'll see gorgeous pecan sticky buns and cinnamon rolls, but they're not the most um, tolerant recipes for uh, tweaking or for error. We have chocolate peppermint brownies. We got a lot of chocolate peppermint stuff. We got the brownies, we got cookies, we got the bark. We have a pumpkin cheesecake. We have a chocolate cheesecake. Now, both of these were developed with uh, Green, uh, Green Valley um, lactose-free cream cheese. I have found that not all lactose-free cream cheese uh, cheese products are equal. In fact, they are all very different. So I have, I have made these with these particular uh, cream cheese products. They will work if you use them. Um, the salted caramel banana cake was one of the pictures in the sign up that Robin sent out. That is a showstopper. And an overnight eggnog, eggnog French toast. This is a great uh, dish that you can prepare the night before. You're basically taking a 13 by nine pan. You've got a uh, low FODMAP bread. You're making a just a, it's a custard really, like what you make for any kind of French toast where you're combining uh, milk and egg and a little sugar and there's nutmeg and a little cinnamon. And you're just uh, layering the, the, the bread in the pan and you're pouring this mixture on top. It gets to sit in the fridge overnight. You pull it out, you stick it in the oven, and you have French toast for a crowd. You don't have to sit, stand over the oven making um, individual, um, uh, uh, you know, servings. Um, okay, we're about almost 10 of, I'm just going to, this is our last slide. I'm going to go through this really quickly, and then I want to talk with you folks. So cheers. We also have um, all kinds of beverages. We have an awesome article on cocktails and mocktails. We have plenty of non-alcoholic beverages on the website. Um, one of my pet peeves, hot chocolates, not hot cocoa. Not the same thing. We got recipes for both. Hot chocolate uses chocolate. Hot cocoa uses cocoa. They're both delicious depending on what you want and what you have in your pantry. We have you covered. We have eggnog times two, meaning we have one uh, recipe which is uh, with alcohol, one without. We have mint hot chocolate, mulled wine. We have those liqueur recipes I mentioned before, and we have all kinds of fancy mixed drinks. So that is all the slides that I have, but I am here for a little over 10 minutes to answer your questions. So I'm gonna dive back in. Okay. Um, are the recipes la labeled beginner? Okay, Felicia, what we do is, um, I don't have a beginner label, but we do have an easy label and we have a quick label. And the way we, do, the way we define easy at FODMAP every day is that the recipe has 15 minutes or less of prep time. Now that means it might be in the oven for an hour, but easy is just 15 minutes of prep time. Quick, means you can do the recipe top to bottom in 30 minutes. So I know that that's not specific to beginner, but it gives you a sense of things that at least are, are maybe easier than not. We had someone make the, oh wait, you used a Canadian, a different, oh, I see you used regular cream cheese. You used a different, tell me, Michelle, what kind of cream cheese did you use? Because that might help other people. She says she made our pumpkin cheesecake. So I would love to know what you used. Let's see. And just chime in with other questions. Cause I'm sure like if it wasn't for Rhonda, I would, oh, she, oh, you used the conventional craft. I see. And then you just limited your servings. Okay. Good to know. Good to know. Because that's a good point. So um, dairy, you know, things like ricotta cheese, cream cheese, sour cream. I mean, there's a bunch of dairy that does have a two tablespoon serving size on the site. Um, so check that out. Robin Hood. Okay. Someone's asking about Robin Hood gluten-free flour that it has some pea hull fiber in it. Okay. Great question. 
I am aware of it. I have not used the flower. And when it comes to pea anything, I mean, first of all, the fact that this is not a pea protein, the fact that it's a fiber, it really could wreak some havoc with certain people. Um, pea protein is um, something that comes up a lot um, in our various groups. It's a little confusing. We have an article that specifically delves into pea protein. The thing with pea products is it seems as though there are small amounts that are low FODMAP. However, it also appears anecdotally that a lot of people are really sensitive to it and, and have breakthrough um, uh, uh, IBS symptoms. So I think that's from, from a FODMAP perspective, uh, Emily, it's going to come down to how you react or not. And in terms of how it works in a recipe, I can't speak to it because I, I haven't used it. Uh, Perry wants to know if we'll do a dinner and lunch. We haven't yet. Um, we'll, we'll write that down. <laughs> yeah, Robin's already on it. Um, any other any other things? Well, I'm very excited this afternoon. So I'm going to be diving into that fruitcake. As I said, um, I'm going to be doing one version with whiskey and also one version using the orange liqueur uh, recipe. Um, thank you, Rhonda. That's so sweet heart to you too. Rhonda, just so you know, you know, it's very exciting for me. Rhonda always shows us what she's doing. We love seeing our recipes come to life. If you guys make something and you want to share it, um, if you're not a member of the Low FODMAP for Foodies Facebook group, please come join us. There are a lot of serious foodies and bakers over there. We do have some strict rules. Um, we have another group called, uh, uncensored low FODMAP recipes. Some of the same people are in that group. That group has much looser, freer rules. So one might appeal to you more than the other. Okay, Carla says she's used tofu and it has uh, the soy um, that it has a serving size on the app. Is there a soy? All right, you're teaching me something I didn't know. There's a soy cream cheese on the Monash app. Is that what you're telling me, Carla? I'm absolutely flabbergasted. I will go check that. Um, the fruits I'm putting in the cake, uh, Bumika, is that how you say your name? I hope I'm not screwing that up. I'm going to be using the mixed candied peel, which is on the Monash app. So that is a lemon, candied lemon peel, candied orange peel. There will be raisins, there will be candied, uh, not candied, there'll be dried cranberries. There will be a small amount of figs and a small amount of dates. And um, the dates and figs thing is I'm going to be mixing and matching information from FODMAP Friendly and Monash University. Um, FODMAP Friendly has lab tested those dried fruits and has come out with uh, different lab results than Monash. Um, they're more generous. I will explain all of that in the recipe. And, you know, as you know, uh, this diet comes down to how we all individually react to these things anyway. Oh, Bumika says I can call her boo. Okay, you're my boo. Awesome. awesome. Janine says great information. She's new to FODMAP. Janine, if you have not signed up for our um, newsletter yet at FODMAP every day, or if any of you have not signed up for the newsletter, I recommend that you do because what happens is you will immediately get what we call our quick start program, which is a, or quick start series, which is a funnel of a flurry of emails. Okay. So the, for the first few days, we barrage you with emails, but those emails are meant to be archived and saved because they have the links to all of the articles that we think that you need on timing of digestive systems and symptoms and how to find a low FODMAP registered dietitian and all that stuff. And some people panic because all of a sudden they're getting a ton of emails from us, but it's just a couple of days where you're getting this little flurry of the quick start series. And then the, uh, the uh, newsletter is even out to about twice a week. So if you're new to the diet, it's a great way to get everything you need uh, in one place. So that's that. Well, we're uh, got a few more minutes. It is Perry. It is so easy to feel overwhelmed and alone. You know, I. So here's the thing: we have over fifteen thousand people in our foodies group, for instance. And I was talking to somebody else 
online this morning uh, about, she has a different medical issue, um, but she asked a question on Facebook. And I said, you know, I think the Facebook groups are really amazing for many things. They're amazing for not feeling alone. They're amazing for getting different kinds of tips and tricks like the lactase drops or, you know, things like that. But I caution you about not using Facebook or other social platforms for your medical questions. You know, I'm not an MD, I'm not an RD. It, that's what you should be using your medical team for. But, but there is a way to use social media to help you not feel alone, right? So just again, statistics, you are one, one in five, average one in five people worldwide have irritable bowel syndrome. We are over 42 million strong in the US alone. You are far from alone. And, you know, being able to talk about it is important, right? Because we shouldn't feel ashamed. We shouldn't feel embarrassed. Everybody farts, poops, pees, you know, gets tummy aches. And, you know, we're here to help mitigate that and hopefully in as a delicious a way as possible. There. Somehow I ended on an up note. Didn't want to end on the on the down note. <laughs> so we're almost again at the top of the hour. Thank you, Robin. Yes, Robin manages so much of our business. Could not do it without her. Oh, so someone said, oh, she said soy. Okay, soy. Carla said not soy cream cheese. They have a thing about soy cheese, right? Well, you know, and it's also extrapolations. You know, soy cheese. Monash tested a soy cheese. We don't know what soy cheese, right? There are soy cheeses that contain inulin. There are ones that don't. There are soy cheeses that contain natural flavors. There are soy cheeses that don't. So um, sometimes I get frustrated with the app because there are entries like that that are not quite specific enough to really give us the help that we need. Uh, Chris said, you had surgery, it's helping. Yay. Well, thank you so much, everybody. I expect to see, I want to get flooded with pictures of baked goods. I want to see what you're making, whether it's mine or somebody else's, or if you have questions about our recipes or other baking recipes, hit me up, uh, dayday at daydaywilson.com. You can find me easily in our foodies group. If you haven't joined foodies, if you haven't joined low FODMAP for foodies and you want to, please just make sure to answer all the questions. A lot of people stop at the first question and then I, I don't let you in. Um, who's a little piggy? Piggy's waving to me. Is that a piggy? There we go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. This has been great. And if you're watching this on replay, know that you can find us at FODMAP every day. We're here to help you thrive on the low FODMAP diet. Bye-bye.